Thank you very much, uh, Christian, and welcome to everyone uh, to this webinar. I'm so uh, pleased to see you here. Uh, as uh, Christian just said, I'm Kevin Perkins, the Executive Director of Farm Radio International. And just a word about uh, this organization, those that may be new to us. Uh, we're an organization that uh, does communication for development. We have a mission to make radio a more powerful force for good in rural Africa. One that shares knowledge, amplifies rural voices, and supports positive change. Uh, we do that in part by combining radio with mobile phone technology uh, so that it provides uh, communities, uh, rural households with information that they can use to make the best decisions for themselves and their communities. We work with over 1,300 African radio stations right across the continent who then develop and air radio programs that meet the information needs of their listeners and their communities. <clears throat> We also help these stations amplify the voices of their listeners and thereby rural farming families and support positive action in their communities to bring about a change uh, and improvements in the lives of people who live there. It's often asked of me and, and others who work at Farm Radio, you know, why are you still using radio? After all, it's not a new technology. And there has been amazing growth in new communication devices and technologies and applications. Um, well, to that, I have two words. First, uh, radio works. It still works. It remains the best way to provide particularly audio communication services, which is important in areas where uh, literacy may, levels still may not be very high. And it also provides those services uh, to rural Africans in their own languages. Second, today's radio has changed. It's different. Uh, by combining radio with mobile phones and digital applications, Radio programs have really been transformed into much more interactive, two-way uh, communication services that bring rural voices onto the airways and allows listeners to access the content uh, more on demand when, uh, when, when, when the time is convenient for them by making an inexpensive phone call uh, to access uh, uh, audio recordings. I'm so happy that you've joined us for this important conversation about food security in Africa. It's a really critical issue at these times, an important one for us all to pay more attention to. We're a firm believer that providing people with the best information to make informed choices is one of the best ways to affect change. Uh, so please that you could come and join us and learning more about the topic and how uh, communication can make a difference. With inflation, the war in Ukraine, conflicts in several parts of Africa, climate change, in the inflation uh, and health crises. Uh, um, there's many uh, causes of, uh, of, uh, of the food crisis that we're seeing. And um, <clears throat> there's no doubt in my mind, while, while there's many causes, one of the biggest ones is something that I call uh, information poverty. Uh, poor access to reliable and relevant information at the right time, the lack of opportunities to express needs and share feedback, these are some of the barriers to small-scale farmers improving yields and income and coping, uh, being resilient in the face of crises such as the current food crisis. Uh, because of these exceptional circumstances, we wanted to bring you, our donors, together with those who are responding to the food security crisis in Africa so that you can hear what's happening and how we can all make a difference. Uh, today, uh, you'll hear more uh, in their introductions from, from our host, David Gutnick, but you'll be hearing from Sibby Lawson Marriott, Brenda uh, Morange, uh, Betty Mujungu, and Gizau Shibru. And they'll be talking about how food security is being affected on multiple levels. We want to give you, uh, the supporters of Farm Radio, an update so you can hear directly from people on the front lines in Africa and provide an opportunity to ask questions. If you've been uh, we're supporting us and part of our kind of community for a while, you already know uh, how your generosity is helping to improve food security for millions of African farming families right across the continent. And if we don't say it enough, thank you for being part of that success. But if you're not, but, but, but if you're new, and uh, this is the first time you're hearing about Farm Radio, we hope that you'll consider joining us uh, in this important work. 
Uh, the town hall is being recorded and we'll be sharing the video on our social media channels via email as well. Uh, so, and I also encourage you uh, to share it widely with your friends, colleagues, and your family so we can help spread the word. And with that, I'd like to now turn it over to our amazing host for today, uh, one of my favorite uh, radio broadcasters, uh, well known for his wonderful uh, documentaries uh, and many other um, uh, radio uh, outputs. Uh, he's an award-winning documentary producer from CBC, and he's now a uh, member of the board of directors of Farm Radio International. He's provided training and mentoring for our radio partners in Africa for years. Uh, and for over three decades, he's worked with uh, CBC telling thousands of radio stories about people he's met all over the world. Uh, thanks so much for being part of us, uh, part of this uh, event with us and hosting uh, the remainder of this uh, webinar. Over to you, David. And again, thank you. Hi, hi, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Wow, there's so much to talk about. So I'm sitting here in Montreal and I'm seeing all of these uh, faces uh, in Africa where farm radio is based. And, and I have to say, Kevin, the thing about 15 years ago, I went as a trainer uh, to Africa, to Mali, to train for farm radio. And I got there and people were saying, well, we have to go into the fields and meet the farmers. So we get in a car, we go out into a field and there's a farmer, he waves and he comes walking over to the car with a radio hanging around his neck. And there he'd been in the field with his wife and the two of them had been farming away and, and they came over. And that, it, it, that image just struck me, that when you're spending hours and hours and hours in the field, what do you do? You get tired of talking to your partner, so what do you do? You listen to the radio. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the, uh, over the years as being a broadcaster is, uh, number one, get your facts right. And number two, make your program fit the, 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 the crano, the, the part of the radio that it's to go on. But number three was really, really important. Number three is don't be boring. And so what Farm Radio has been doing is helping to train broadcasters to get messages out there so that when people are listening to the radio in the field, they can become better farmers. And that's what's so wonderful about this is it's, it's, it's using that technology that's been around for such a long time in new ways. And as, as, as Kevin mentioned, one of the exciting parts of farm radio right now is that it's interactive. So when you think of old fashioned radio, what do you think about? There you are, you're home, you're in your car, and someone is talking to you, at you. But you wanna answer, so you start yelling, but there's nobody listening. But now with cell phones, what can people do? The radio program can say, hey, if you have an idea on how to better raise chickens, type in the following numbers and send a comment, an SMS, a text message, and we'll answer you on the radio. And you get this back and forth. So we, we still call it radio, but it's, it's becoming more than that. It's so exciting. Just one last little, 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 little tidbit. When I first arrived in Mali, there weren't cell phones really yet. People weren't using them that much. And people were going, well, you know, if we're gonna bring the internet to, to, to the world, well, I guess we're gonna to have to put the cables over the mountains or drill holes through mountains. And it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of, of kilometers of cables. What are we gonna do? And then a couple of years later, it's all wireless. So technology just jumped decades in just a few years. So that's what's, uh, that's what's so terribly exciting. Now, one of the, you know, when I was doing my research for this, I was Googling around because I knew uh, CB Lawson Marriott was gonna be, going to be the World Food Bank guest here and, and, talking, and talking to us. And I just thought that it was so important to talk about how CB has been so involved over the decades. So CB, I just want you to talk a little bit about what it has been like for you uh, as a young person who, start, who I guess decided that you wanted to help the world. And what have you seen? And tell us a little bit about how you as a, as, a, as a person got involved.
unmute myself. There we go. Thank you very much, David. It's so exciting to be, to be a part of this. And certainly over the years, working in different parts of the African continent, radio has always been such a critical part of the work we do, sharing information. I work for the World Food Program. Maybe I should start there. Yeah, I work for the World Food Program and I work in our regional bureau in Eastern Africa. And that covers uh, 10 countries in the region, which includes Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, South Sudan, Sudan, Burundi, and Rwanda. And previous to that, I worked in, in Southern Africa and also have worked in West Africa as well. So really a good, a good overview of the different challenges, different contexts all over the continent, different challenges as the years progress. But radio has always been a core part of how we have tried to disseminate information. And as you say, more and more receive information about what's going on uh, at the community level. You know, our organization, its mandate is to address hunger, whether that be acute hunger from a crisis, chronic hunger from a system that's not functioning and everything in between. And a big part of that has always been information, getting information out. And, and it's fascinating to see how, how radio has, has always been a part of that. Um, you know, when you work on food and nutrition issues, it's a very interconnected thing. You find yourself talking about issues of water, issues of health, issues of climate, issues that affect farmers, women, and so on. And I'm really excited to talk about some of that today. Yeah. yeah so we talked today about what's behind the headlines. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I got my, I got my newspaper today the Globe mm -hmm. and Mail, and I look through it, and you know what? There's almost nothing. There was a, a couple of lines about the famine. That was it. There was a big article about the war in Ukraine. There was a big article about various you know, political things happening in Canada. But I couldn't find anything about what you're seeing every day. So what is, what is happening? And it's, it's so great to have an opportunity to try to build a picture of what's happening, as you said, on the ground. What's taking the headlines very much is, is the Ukraine war and is the upcoming conference on climate, COP, which is happening in Egypt in just a few days. And that's widely regarded as Africa's COP. And I, I can even speak a little bit about why that is the case. But to say what is actually happening. So in these countries that I've talked about, so Eastern Central Africa, we're in a really critical moment, and that's for a number of reasons, but just to let you know where that's ending up, all of it. At the beginning of 2022, there were 12 mil million people, which is a large number of people, who were so-called acutely food insecure hungry. It means they couldn't get a basic one meal a day, which is really the minimum, um, and, and that was 12 million people. If you fast forward now to November, we're talking about 21 million people. You know, by nationality, I'm from Benin. We have a population of 10 million people, just to try to get a scope, because it's hard to envision what millions of people is. And of course, it's not everywhere, but in, when you aggregate the people that are in crisis in the different parts of the region, you come up with this staggering figure of 21 million. What's concerning is that the rate at which that's increasing as more and more livelihoods fail, safety nets are not able to keep up, humanitarian response cannot keep up with the acute needs, let alone the chronic needs, we're looking at about 23 to 25 million people by February next year who are going to be in need of some pretty targeted support. And that's what's not making the news because we've become a bit immune to this bad news. What's interesting is the ways in which the Ukraine crisis is affecting everyday business all over the continent. And, you know, the Ukraine crisis, we didn't get here overnight. Some of the factors, we did not recover. And by we, I mean communities, households all over the place in different, different vocations, different livelihoods from COVID. You know, what COVID did, it restricted movement. It, it disrupted the supply chains. Who knew supply chains for inputs, for fertilizer, for food were so weak in our area? Once you restricted people's access to their jobs or those jobs were no longer there or transport wasn't available, you couldn't get to your farm, you couldn't, you couldn't trade at markets, that had a huge impact that, that really we're still recovering from. Truly, we are still recovering from that. Before we recovered from that, now we had Ukraine. And the Ukraine crisis exposed just how dependent many African countries were on the imports of grains, certainly, but also of fertilizer, of other kinds of inputs that are vital for, for farming communities. 
fragile livelihoods, fragmentation. We haven't had a chance to recover from that, but what Ukraine did was raise the prices of basic staples at every market. And we do monitor markets all over the continent. What's the cost of living? What's the cost of food? And we saw how quickly those prices went up everywhere. There was a fuel price crisis, which of course lifted up the cost of everything else. And this is what we're referring to as the global food crisis. It's really impacting our region and then climate. And with climate, uh, this has been a slow burn. You'll see in the news about droughts and floods. These are the shocks, so-called, and they're not to be underestimated. With the droughts, you know, they're decimating livestock herds, they're decimating crops that have been planted, so many effects, and of course, floods that wash away farms, that wash away homes. But the thing is, that these are, are getting more frequent, the droughts and floods that we hear about. We don't talk often enough about the stressors. And I think that's what really is being felt by the farmers in the areas that we're working. What I mean by that is things like heat waves, for example, long extended heat waves, elevated temperatures. When you have a lot of rainfall, you're gonna have moisture. This gives rise to pests such as locusts. We heard a lot about the desert locusts because this is something that had never been seen before. There's also others that haven't caught the headlines like army worm and so on. There are dust storms. There, there are all kinds of rising lake waters. Rivers are doing things differently. So it's, it's the unpredictable nature of what's happening that is as much of a problem as, as the shocks themselves. If we are in a region where the majority of people were dependent on rain-fed agriculture, variability is a huge issue. There was some room for, for a bit of error, but generally rain-fed agriculture means you know when the rains are generally going to come, and you know the volume in which they're going to come, and that's all out the window. We have started talking about a fourth or fifth failed rainy season. At what point do we say, that rainy season is now changed. Maybe we can't depend on rain-fed agriculture as, as, as we used to. And so we are looking at new challenges, old challenges and new challenges, and these need new partnerships and new solutions. So, you know, I listen to you and I go, oh my God, you know, here you are with the World Food Program and it's just, it's so huge. I see giant airplanes dumping off grain. I see soldiers and crowds of people trying to grab food off the back of trucks. Yeah. What about the local farmers? Here we are, Farm Radio, and we're saying to farmers, hey, maybe, maybe you can compost a little better and we can use radio to help you help your family better, you know, you and mm -hmm. your husband. So the things that WFP is known for and has won the Nobel Prize for and probably the amazing logistics that you've seen, this is a huge part of it. So there are acute needs that need to be met. And if people need food, we will give them food. That's true. And since the beginning of the year, the organization has distributed $500 million of cash transfers. That is just money in the hands of people to buy food. That's an enormous amount of money. What it does do, though, is stimulate local markets. But cash transfers, direct delivery of food, that's the least of it. That's just the immediate acute needs. We know that, first of all, we can't get food or cash to everyone who needs it. So that's, that's not a full solution. And it's definitely not what's going to get us out of the solution. What is going to get us out of the solution is investing in the producers. And by farmers, I mean people who are growing crops, but also herders, livestock herders. So much of our region is dry and arid lands where pastoralism is a big part of the livelihood. So we have to keep them as in mind as well. And so it becomes very much what one might call a food system response, which means this crisis has forced us to do things that we've been wanting to do anyway. Invest in local value chains. What I mean by that is a lot of the attention has gone to maize and wheat and commercial crops, and we've neglected some of the indigenous crops that are more climate resilient, more appropriate for the, for the kind of soils that we have, millet, sorghum, teff, and things like that. So trying to bring investment to those. 
trying also to help small farmers, small producers, small communities manage their climate risk. This is where we are right now. The climate crisis is already in full effect in our region. We are already, it has translated into a livelihood crisis. So can we help farmers get micro insurance, for example, for floods or drought? Can we find ways to provide assistance before shocks hit? Not waiting until the drought is at its worst stage or the flood happens. Now we have enough technology to know when these things are going to happen. But we still tend to sit back and wait before we start really kicking into gear. So if we have the science to really forecast what is going to happen in terms of shocks and stressors, temperature rises and so on, we have to adapt. We have to all work together to adapt to this new climate, to protect people right now. Small farmers and pastoralists are bearing this risk on their own, the climate risk. There are mechanisms, microinsurance, that can help share that risk as we do when we drive a car, we get an insurance company to insure us against an accident, we can insure farmers and pastoralists against this. This means that when the shock hits, you may get resources to buy fodder, get access to water, veterinary care, maybe buy a new round of seeds. And this is what we've seen really working. So you may not have to pull your child out of school to save money to buy a second round of seeds. Maybe we can prevent early marriages, sale of valuable assets, those kind of negative coping strategies that people turn to in crisis. I hear optimism. Is that Indeed. possible? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we cannot afford to, to, to throw up our hands and think that there's no solutions. There are absolutely solutions, tools, things that can be done. Ironically, because of the Ukraine crisis, whether we liked it or not, we found ourselves in a new era of transformation. This is the first time that many stakeholders are openly acknowledging something needs to change about how we were doing business. And this crisis has forced us to do so. Never let a good crisis go to waste and so on as Mr. <laughs> Churchill said now we are seeing a real interest in both in terms of governments in terms of international actors foundations what do we need to do to get ready for what we know is coming on account of the climate change do we need to invest in new types of seeds do we need to get more local with the support that we provide to, to farmers do we need to find new ways of getting information out about what this climate change is looking like so localization innovation you know these are young countries we have a a lot of young people in the countries in our region, but there are also young governments faced with enormous challenges. But there's energy out there to do things differently. If I go back to the analogy you mentioned, most people that we know this generation, they never had a landline phone. We just went from not having any phone at all. It made more sense to get a cell phone. We can leapfrog into new greener technologies, new kinds of irrigation, new seeds. And there's a big willingness out there internationally from foundations, from governments even, to invest in that, to crowd investments into local solutions. Wow. My, my, I, th that was wonderful. I have my head just absolutely full. And mm -hmm. you can clearly see your passion. It's just thank you yeah. so much. Your passion is uh, absolutely wonderful. And good luck at COP. I hope actually that... Yes. One interesting thing on COP that I'd like to mention as we go in, I mentioned earlier that this is seen as Africa's COP. And what it is, is an acknowledgement that what we had hoped for in terms of a reduction in emissions that would have slowed this climate change doesn't seem to be happening. The focus at this COP is can we get financing for the solutions that need to happen at a local level? That is really the thing to look for at this COP. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. And, and, and uh, CP mentioned uh, the importance of young people, young broadcasters, young really? people involved in, in, in food. And that is exactly where we're going to turn to next. And you're going to hear right from two young broadcasters in the field who see it every day. So you're going to hear from Betty. Betty Munjugu is a Ugandan female broadcaster. She works with 101 Voice of Toro in Uganda. She's a show host, a team leader, and she's been working in food issues for uh, for almost a decade now. As well, we're going to hear from Brenda. Uh, Brenda Muraganji is a radio craft officer in Uganda, and communications has been really uh, important for her over the years. And she's also, believe it or not, a trained secondary school teacher, and she's been working in the media 
for 19 years. So now Betty and Brenda are going to talk to each other and we'll be able to sort of peek inside the kind of conversations that people have in the field talking about food insecurity. So over to you, Brenda and, uh, and Betty. Thank you, David. Uh, now, Betty, um, I hope you're there, Betty. Um, you work with a voice of terror, a rural radio station with a reach of uh, 4 million people who are mostly farmers. And of course, you have varied opportunities to interact and engage with the thousands of listeners on a daily basis. Uh, either on air or uh, when you do those uh, field visits to farming communities. May you please share with us about what could be some of those uh, uh, biggest challenges in regard to food security that frequently uh, crop up during such uh, interactions. Hi, Betty. Can you hear? Hello? Oh. Hi. Hi, Betty. Oh, there yes. you are. Hi, Betty. Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, first of all, I want to take this opportunity uh, before I respond to the question. Uh, I want to thank Farm Radio International for giving me the opportunity to share farmers' experiences in this meeting and also thank Farm Radio International for the great work you do to share knowledge and amplify farmers' voices. It's true that food insecurity and hunger are a big threat to millions of people in Uganda and uh, in Kabarole, where I come from, my community that I serve as a broadcaster, it's predominantly an agriculture community and actually considered a food basket for Uganda. But surprisingly, a bigger percentage of uh, people in my community uh, depend or survive on one meal a day. And this of course has increased malnutrition in both adults and um, and young people, but also because of hunger, there has been, because there's no enough food, it has contributed to a lot of social injustices like uh, domestic violence, early marriages and all that. And in the engagements that we have as a radio station with farmers, because we have shows that are deliberate to improve food security in the community, and as um, broadcasters, the farmers that we do speak to on a daily basis have issues or challenges with getting food on the table, but also with food security at its general. And uh, because we, the farmers and the entire community, we rely on farming as a source of living, as a source of income. So the farmers have been farming for quite a time, like it's something that your parents pass on to you. So there's been intensive farming, and of course, combined with the droughts, it has left land infertile. And of course, without fertile land, it, 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 is, it is very tricky to have food. And the same land that people have tilled for quite a time has lost its fertility, it has lost its capacity to produce food, bigger yields of food, because currently uh, the farmers have to use a lot of fertilizer for them to be able to get the yields or even put food on the table. Also, Brenda, um, some of the things that come out loud by the farmers is uh, mm. unpredictable changing seasons. And of course, due to the changing weather patterns, um, where when it rains, it really rains beyond rain. And when it shines, it also shines just beyond the usual sight shining. And of course, as farmers that have been doing this for quite a time, like for a whole living, um, they are so, uh, um, so in touch with the seasons. Like we know 
that uh, in the month of February to uh, th that's planting season. And we know that by June, that's harvesting season for those seasons. So people know the seasons, but the change of seasons that is unpredictable has actually affected food security in our communities. And also Brenda, um, I think because of the changing patterns, the weather and all uh, uh, the climate, there are so many strange pests and diseases. Eh? There are pests and diseases that are so drug resistant. So again, due to the changing weather patterns and unreliable products on the market, like pesticides and fertilizers, it makes it worse that um, farmers will incur costs to have the fertilizers that will still not make a very big difference in terms of yields. But also, uh, Brenda, I'll, I'll share with you a, a story of one of, of the farmers, one of the women farmers that we do interact with in our mm -hmm. farmer groups, Lucy, who is a single mom and a single mother. She, def, she, she her biggest source of income is banana. So she has an, she operates on half an acre of land and that's where she does her banana farming. Four years ago, uh, a bunch of matoke or banana was at 25,000 shillings. And uh, that's around, I think, nine Canadian dollars. And a whole season, that's a year, she would be able to get 5 million Ugandan shillings. And that's around, I think, uh, 1,700 and something Canadian dollars. But at the moment, because of strange diseases that come in and seem to be very uh, drug resistant, there is uh, the banana rust thrips disease that has eaten up and infected her entire banana plantation. And her biggest market was restaurants and the restaurants cannot buy banana that has rusted in that way. So she's making losses from 25,000 Ugandan shillings of a, a, a matoke or a banana, but today she's selling it at 5,000. That is how strong um, the, the changing weather has affected farmers in our community. Interesting. And uh, uh, it's very unfortunate uh, hearing that uh, from uh, uh, your community. Uh, it uh, it uh, takes me back to what CB was talking about, CB from World Food Program. Uh, she was uh, mentioning the need for new solutions uh, to new climate problems. I hear you mentioning something about uh, the changing weather patterns. And then you mentioned uh, uh, pests and diseases, you mentioned soil infertility, among other biggest challenges that are affecting uh, your community, especially when it comes to food security. Now, I would like to understand, uh, rural farmers are known to be uh, creative and innovative, at least in, uh, in Uganda and in Africa. They are known to be creative and innovative in finding local solutions uh, to uh, the various challenges that uh, come to uh, that uh, come to the occupation that affect their work. How are they adapting and coping amidst uh, these uh, several challenges that you've just mentioned uh, that are affecting food security? Thank you, Brenda. Like I earlier said, that um, um, the community here, uh, farmers and all the people depend on agriculture as the biggest source of income. So by all means, and we know that farmers are very creative, they are able to do all that's possible to ensure that they have food because that's a source of living. But um, from the sharings and the meetings that we have had engagements um, with farmers, it is true that they are adopting to uh, regenerative agriculture, like they're doing a lot of crop rotation at the moment mm -hmm. in order to give um, some gardens a breather as one way of thinking that probably the soil will be able to rest a bit and also be able to produce its nutrients. But also the farmers at the moment are doing a lot of mixed farming, mm -hmm. like uh, with, with the many conversations, with, with the many awareness rising, like most of the farmers at the moment have animals in their, in their spaces. Like they have cows, 
you find at least they have one zero grazing cow in order to be able to get cow dung to add to make manure for their um, plantations. But also um, they have rabbits, they're keeping rabbits in order to fetch uh, rabbit urine to add on the value and nutrient to the land. And also the chicken, they're rearing some chicken in order to have droplets that would enable them to use organic fertilizer in their plantations. So um, those are some of the things that they are doing locally and through their own creativity to ensure that um, they are able to still have the food because that's the source of income. But also some farmers have adopted um, planting trees around their farms, and of course to support the ecosystem, but, but also to help in, in um, in the weather. So basically, um, of course, that's, that's helping, that's helping, but it is, it, it is work in progress because the weather changing patterns are stronger than just crop rotation. They are stronger than, than just chicken droppings to be able to enhance the, the nutrients in the soil. So yes, the farmers are working hard to ensure that they have a source of income, that there is food on the table, because not having food, I mean, it, it, it's a very sad experience. And, and at, at the same time, it also increases a lot of social injustices, domestic violence and all that stuff. So they are really working hard and creatively. Uh, Betty, how are women and youth in your region contributing to food security? Thank you, Brenda. And I, I know that we all know that uh, at, at even a world percentage that women contribute most of the food in, in the markets. I mean, women contribute 80% of food security. And it's just the same in my community, in the communities that we serve. Because in my culture, and of course the culture of very many other Ugandans, we know that the women are in charge of having food on the table. So women work a lot to ensure that there is food. But at the moment with all the sensitizations and the rising awareness that are going on, the youth are some of the energetic people that have jumped into farming and therefore contributing to food security. And like I told you that it's just a culture that uh, it is now work in progress that men are also getting on board to contribute to food. So uh, in some of the awareness campaigns that we are doing is to have unity farming. I mean, if, if a woman and, and, and the children or the youth are contributing, uh, let's say, for example, if they are contributing in a family like 40% to the food, then if the men as well come on board, we know that definitely uh, the percentage will rise. So women and the youth are doing quite a, a good job to see that there's food and rising food security, but the men are also on board and doing all that it takes. Uh, apart from uh, the men not being uh, very involved in uh, uh, their in uh, roles uh, of uh, contributing uh, towards food security, are there any other concerns that uh, you feel are uh, deterring uh, uh, food security, uh, the food security contribution uh, by the women and youth? apart from the men not being involved? Of course, food security is a whole big thing, Brenda. It, it, I mean, it's something big that the women and the youth will not do it alone. It, it's work in progress with all the changing patterns that the weather is just beyond a woman going to the garden. So yeah. they are doing all that they, they have to do. But of course, there are bigger issues that need to be addressed, like issues of the weather, like issues of government being supportive to probably the other day, uh, we had a conversation with the government and they were thinking of having a soil testing machine available for farmers to be able to test their soils. So it's basically a lot of work that um, just the women and women and men and the youth going to the farms is just not enough. We have to be able to address the weather changing patterns, but also probably even having seeds that are more resistant to, 
to the weather changes. So, yes. Brenda and Betty, this is, here I am sitting in Canada and I'm listening to you and I'm going, this is amazing. It's like I'm listening to a farm radio broadcast. Because I would imagine when you are on the radio, this is the kind of things that you do every day. That you would yes. be talking like about these kinds of things and people in the fields would be listening and, and maybe a wife would be going, yeah, I've got to get my husband more involved here. Yeah. You know, he's got to get more responsible because if we're doing 80% of the work, then, you know, he's, he's got to help me more. We've got to, we've got to figure this out. Yeah. So that's yeah. the kind of things that you'd be talking about on the radio, is it? Yeah, yes. indeed. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, training that uh, we offer the radio broadcasters as a farm radio international Uganda and uh, uh, the trainings enable the broadcasters uh, to do good work in producing programs that will speak to the farmers that will create that will cause that change that we need. Uh, to see happening in the farmers. Uh, that will give a farmer a chance to learn uh, practices like she mentioned, regenerative uh, agriculture practices, among others, that will help them address some of the problems that uh, affect them as uh, rural farmers out there in the different communities. Thank you two so much. That was just fascinating. Yeah. It really was, it really was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. And now we're going, to continue, we're going to continue on the radio theme because we've got uh, Izao Shibru, who works for Farm Radio International. He's the Senior Director of Operations. There he is now on the screen. Hi, hi, Gazao. Hi, Dave. So listening to the, what you've heard today, you know, you hear, you heard uh, CB talking from the, the big perspective and, and how she sees, you know, 26 million people right now in, in crisis. And then you hear Betty and Brenda talking at the local level. Well, you know, we've got our radio shows. Here's what we're talking about. You've been around this business for a long time. So what are you hearing today? What are you hearing when you listen to these women talking about both the, the big, big picture and the little picture and, and the role of farm radio? Both, I mean, working in the sector, and living through it on the great famine in Ethiopia and being in Rwanda and uh, Malawi, all the sectors in the past, I thought this is behind us. So I was, there was hope the, before three or four years ago and all of a sudden we are where we are. As CB said, if people, like us are going to say, what are we going to do? Means we can do something about this. We have done something about this. We have saved millions of lives and the world can get together and do this happen. As we speak, many millions, farmers, children, women are going hungry. And this is a plentiful world. And we have capacity across the continent. We have a young population, young farmers who are ready to change their life and their family life. So organizations like many organizations, there are many organizations like our organization, we reach, we have ears of millions of farmers across the Saharan continent, millions of farmers. Over, we, we work over 1,300 radio stations who broadcast farming programs with different languages. Over 800 different languages. Not only we speak with them uh, in French or English, but we speak with them Kiswahili, Amharic, Hausa, Bambara, you name it. We speak and we reach to them and that changes their life. So, so something can be done and is being done. So is the radio getting better and better? Because farm radio now has, has, been, has been working for decades in Africa. Are you seeing the change? Is, is, is farm radio really able to help local broadcasters? 
make better programs so that those farmers become, I'll say it, better farmers, more productive farmers. Yes, actually, uh, we have trained thousands of farmers online, face to face, on daily. We have nine offices across uh, the continent, but we have online trainings and our broadcasters are well equipped, well informed, and we have so much resources where the broadcasters could reach into farm radio website and they can change it to their local language and bring the radios, the programs to their communities. So many broadcasters on the ground, we, we reach them through many other ways. We have got very well dedicated staff, staff like you see Brenda and uh, people like Betty. I'm sure she is one of the broadcasters we are able to reach and train. And there are thousands of the her kind of broadcaster which farm radio have training and this is making a big impact and difference so when you're in the, wait take me take me to africa so you're in a radio station are you sitting around with the broadcasters and saying well let's go into the field and talk to some farmers and figure out what kind of what they want because the worry always is isn't it in in the uh in in, in 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 the helping world is that oh someone from north america is going to impose the way you're going to do it to an african community you know we're going to tell them what to do but it seems to me that's not at all the way this works that is really it is not yeah and it's not and it should not be and and even the broadcasters, before they put their program on air, they go to the communities and the people they serve and they make their program, get their voices, get back to the studio, get on air. And as you rightly said, right on in your introduction, radio is no more one way. It is interactive. There are listeners. We use listener groups and we get direct questions not only we get questions even to to have women farmers being listened we have a separate line in a couple of projects we have we have made in in africa women to reach out to their questions we have a line dedicated to women farmers and 60 to 80 percent of our farmers are women and we can't ignore their voices and their voices has to be amplified, heard, and we have to answer their question. And we have listener groups where broadcasters sit with them, discuss programs, and come back to prepare programs. We have very many of these kinds across the continent. So this is what is happening. This is ongoing, and it makes it uh, it makes it so interactive. And for the use uh, with the mobile te te telephone. Uh, they, if they want, for example, weather information, they can dial a number and they can get weather information. So they can get update information, not only the information which uh, existed a month or a week ago, but they can get update information, uh, whether it is market price information, uh, weather information, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we have this, this capacity now. No, because I hear a member of the audience listening today says, has a question for you. So food insecurity is primarily, says our listener, a social justice issue about poverty and inequality. And Africa's resource is very resource rich. So the question is, you know, should we be talking about social justice issues here? Is that what we're doing? Use it, but using using uh, talk about agriculture. Like how do you how do you deal with those? those uh those issues what is the best way to do it being self-sufficient that farmers are resilient farmers know their area and farmers can grow their food and we give them the tool to grow it like there are hopes in the continent i was reading um uh, uh last week that in 2023 the ethiopian government says uh, they will not uh, need to import wheat because three quarter of input wheat and fertilizer comes from Ukraine and Russia. 
And the Ethiopian government now is saying, come next year, we will be actually be able to export wheat, not only being self-sufficient. So it is possible. Mm -hmm. so, 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 yeah, go ahead. Right, so, th so you are fighting social justice issues, but you're doing it through, rather than talking politics, you're doing it through giving things to people to eat. Yeah. And, and, and farmers now um, are, if you go into in some villages, farmers, instead of those small, small plots, farmers get together, making their plots a bigger plot and putting their resources together and farmer and, and, and get uh, to farm a bigger land, getting uh, uh, fertilizers together instead of small, small land holdings. This is to help them to get an income. They can't do it alone. And the price at the, at the moment as we speak, 40% uh, of the sub-Saharan continent has a double digit inflation that affects inputs, including uh, fertilizers. So most of the government priority might not be that. So how could we help the farmers to get input so that they can grow food. Now we are talking about 26 million people. The picture next year will be totally different. It could be more, unless otherwise something is done now. Thank you, Giza. That was that was fantastic. I, I, we are getting questions coming in. Uh, CB, are you there? I absolutely am. And I've, I've there's a question. Someone has a question for you. And, and it's from Craig Barlow. Craig says, CB, you described a poly crisis. Does the World Food Program have any programs to support the emotional well-being of the individuals? Because mm. it's such a difficult time. What do you do about that? I think that's a, that's a really good question. And it's one that we don't talk about enough. And I think the main message of, of the World Food Program, but also others, is very similar to what Gizau just mentioned. There are absolutely solutions out there. And there are many people who are willing to put their capacities at the disposal of communities to overcome these issues. The message is not one of hopelessness or despair. The message is about it is time to, people feel encouraged when there is something for them to contribute to, when they feel that they have agency. And as was said, in these areas, we absolutely have agency. And that's the message that WFP and others try to convey to communities that we've been working. This is not the first crisis that Africa has faced. We have faced an HIV crisis. We have faced Ebola. We managed to survive COVID, despite the fact that we were in many senses abandoned by the international community. This is one area where the international community is ready to rally around the most vulnerable. Betty spoke of new kinds of pests that are affecting certain crops. There are, are bioengineers who are really committed to developing solutions. She spoke of soil. There are many techniques, biofertilizer, many institutions, African universities, international universities, who have said we are ready to, to refocus our research agenda to those neglected value chains, these pest outbreaks that haven't gotten the attention that they deserve. So many of the problems are easily resolved with small, simple, low-cost solutions. If I talk about post-harvest losses, for example, uh, an issue that many of the farmers listening to are, are really familiar with. If we are losing 15 to 20 percent of grains, it gets to 20 to 30 percent of pro production when you're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables, even higher with animal products up to 50 percent. Oftentimes the, the solutions are storage, knowledge, information, and that is something that we can do. One thing Africa has is young energetic people, as keeps coming up again and again, but we we need to give them the tools and the knowledge to address their issues in a localized way. And so to those who feel despair or discouraged, there's no need. There is still time to adapt, to adjust. We have survived previous crises. We will survive this one. It's difficult to know what the future solutions will look like, but that's okay. It is okay that we don't know what the future will look like, but we know that we have the capacity to adapt and so much international support behind this. It may May not always get to the headlines. We know that headlines will say millions of people are, but for us, these are people, these are households, these are women like the, the, the banana farmer that Betty described. 
there are solutions out there. We need to make the connections. And that's a role that institutions like WFP, but also many others can play. Bringing that international goodwill, intention, knowledge, technology, science, but also financing at the disposal of, of, of people who need it, who may not always have access to it. And that's what the movement now needs to be. It requires an international effort to support local solutions, local investments, context appropriate investments. Women, we haven't talked enough about women and the ways that they are experiencing this crisis. Some of the quick wins, yes, post-harvest loss reduction will give us some quick wins, but give women farmers, women are at the heart of the food system. They, they, are, they are producing on the farms. They're also transforming the food, meeting the fishing boats, cooking the fish and selling it. They're also making decisions on the market. So how can we empower them more? And we know a lot about women and what they need to thrive. They need access to financing, different technological support. They need to be connected to each other. A big part of what we're doing, and this answers the question that came a bit more directly, is providing platforms and technology for women to get together, whether that be farmers cooperatives, whether that be in other ways to make sure they get training and information that they might not have access to. How can we address their care burdens? We are putting a lot on women. We want them to, to engage, but we need to also address some of the burdens that, that they carry culturally and really be honest about those. Uh, someone, one of the panelists previously mentioned, men understand, they get it, they see the productive capacity of, of the women in their lives. And they want, if you talk to men, they understand these are the champions that we need. But what are the specific technologies that benefit women? Which are the value chains that we should invest in that disproportionately benefit women? Women often go into beans or horticulture or poultry and, and creating new jobs for them in that. We mentioned job creation at the very beginning. They can do primary veterinary care, but it's about thinking outside the box, not getting discouraged, and, and not relenting because we have to adapt very quickly. What's coming down the pipeline for us, it's, it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. But as I said, we're in an era of transformation. Everything is on the table. In my 25 years of work, I've never seen such an appetite for doing things differently. I've never seen such a genuine commitment to localization. That is very different. We've heard a lot of lip service to that, but now it's really happening because it is the only solution, the only way forward. So, so I do think there's reason to be encouraged. Thank you. Wow, that was that was wonderful, CB. Gazal, are you still there? Gazal? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Hi. because so so CB talks about women. She talks about localization. How does Farm Radio therefore expand the network? What do we do? Because you talked, I think, about 1,300 radio stations. Sounds like CB would like every radio station in Africa involved in something like this. And women broadcasters like Betty and Brenda. So what do you do in the field? How do you get this place, this, this organization to grow? The need is now, more than ever now, we have to reach most of our farmers. And I must say, Radio is one great means of communication when you can reach farmers all the way to the village, not only in the cities. So the more radio stations we work in, the more program and financing, financing we have, the better. There are thousands of radio stations which are not included in our program which we want still to bring there are thousands of broadcasters which are which have to be trained to reach out to farmers which we want to train the broadcasters there are a lot of scripts which are needed by the, our broadcasters to reach out to the farmers and we want to do more uh, on that aspect so uh, resources financing is very important because once a farmer is, farmers are, are, are survivors and they don't want handouts. They want to feed their families like anyone, anywhere on earth. So the want that is the important thing we all have to focus, not because they just want to depend on the handouts coming uh, from the north. No, they don't want that. So, um, 
we need to, to work hand in hand so that the small scale holding farmers in Africa can be self-sufficient, can grow their own uh, food and, and feed their families. So we can do this by financing, by reaching out more broadcast, more broadcasters and, and being advocates wherever we are. Wow. I, I, Kevin, are you still there? Do you realize that how much work has just been put back on your plate after listening to this hour of, uh, of conversation? I go, oh, farm radio is going to, you know, you, I, I listen to CB and, 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 and how complex it is up top. I listen to Brenda and, and, and Betty talking about what it's like in the day to day. I listen to Gazal pleading for more money so that more radio stations can get involved. And there you are as the executive director of Farm Radio, listening to all of this. And uh, I'm just wondering what's going through your mind. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks, David. Well, it's just, it's affirmation. You know, the, the work is so important and so timely and, and, and more than ever. And, and the potential to do more and reach more and, and engage more partners and uh, bring more communication services to more people. It's, it's clearly, uh, oh, I can restart my video. Thank you. <laughs> it's clearly, uh, it is clearly there. So, uh, as I said, it's it's really uh, affirming, uh, encouraging, and also a, a clarion call to uh, to to keep uh, our shoulder to the wheel and, and keep looking for opportunities to, uh, to 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 build on what's been done and to build. You know, speaking of localization, to really uh, help to build uh, capacity within. Uh, African countries and communities to really drive the further changes and developments in uh, the quality of communication services they get from local broadcasters, from local communication partners. So I, I just feel inspired and encouraged. Are you are you finding that 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 governments now, that larger foundations too, are understanding what farm radio does and, and want to help more? I'm thinking of, you know, the 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 the, the during the COVID uh, crisis, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the results, you know, one thing that we've been really um, working on uh, over the years is, is, is getting better at getting, uh, finding the evidence, gathering the evidence uh, through good research into what makes the biggest difference, uh, the, the level of change that happens as a result of better access to, to, to the kinds of radio programs and that Betty's producing, uh, and that really that really uh, is encouraging more uh, partners to to consider using these approaches, interactive radio approaches, to to achieve their aims. It, it's not just a matter of sharing information; it's actually about driving change. Well, I think uh, that's really important. Then, so we actually have evidence now that this mm -hmm. works. It's not just because we think it works; we've got yeah. proof. Yeah, we've got data. Lots of data. <laughs> so that's really uh, helping governments. Uh, you know, as was said earlier on, radio has been around for a long time uh, in, in, in Africa, but ministries of agriculture and farmers organizations and women's organizations, even though it's uh, the technology's been around, they're seeing that, you know, the changes that are happening to the way it's delivered, some of the things we've talked about, may mean that it really has to be a vital and central part of efforts to communicate and share information and hear from uh, rural people. Mm. Now, I come away from this hour on a high. Good. I do. I, 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 I've listened to everyone. And, you know, I, 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 I think of what CB said and, and how important it is for women and young people to, 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 to be trusted, finally, because they can, they can, they're the solution. I think, you know, Betty and, and, and Brenda talking back and forth about you know, as, as, as they mentioned, the banana farmer and how complicated it is. I think of Gazab reaching out, wanting all those radio stations. And then I think of you and I go, wow, this is, this, this works. Yeah. It absolutely yeah. works. Yeah. Yep. So, that's, that's what's kept me going for, for 16 years uh, here at Farm Radio is, is really seeing, uh, seeing that it's effective. It, it works and there's, more is needed. So I'm happy to be part of that and happy to join with so many partners and supporters and this kind of big community um, of people that make this work happen. So I'd just like to, I guess we've been, we've been at this now for an hour and 10 minutes. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got, had lots of questions in. And uh, if people want to get in touch with Farm Radio, there's a website, easy to find. Mm -hmm. And uh, the annual report will be coming out soon. And I've seen a draft copy. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful because you, 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 you get a sense of how it's grown, how large it is. But it's, as our, as our panelists said, it's about individuals today. It's about people. It. So absolutely beautiful. So I guess time to, time to thank everybody for, uh, for being here today. Yes, it's, it's, it's been a really good gathering, a really good dialogue and conversation. And thank you. Uh, David, for hosting this so well, and, and thanks to our panelists, uh, Brenda, Betty, Sibby, Gazal. Uh, it's been terrific, and thanks for the questions and and uh, comments from from participants. And if we didn't get back to you uh, during this, we'll we'll certainly follow up and and invite anyone to reach out at any time to to connect. Uh, so thanks all, and thanks for the the wonderful staff who helped to to. Uh, to put this all together, the ones in the back end, keeping it all moving along so nicely. So thank you. And, and unless Christian, you have any final uh, comments, I guess we'll, we'll close this uh, uh, again with a big thank you. No, and a, a special thanks to our, our wonderful MC, uh, David Gutnick. Thank you for leading us through such a, a, a wonderful conversation. And I was just speaking in our, in our group chat of, of how how we should have made this an hour and a half to allow for some some extra questions but what we'll do is we'll um ask our, our our very generous speakers if they have any answers to any of the the questions and and get back to as many people as possible um and also just a reminder that if you're you're feeling so compelled that you want to to do something philanthropic as a result of of this webinar that we we are accepting donations to continue this this important work and you can see a link on the the slide up here Otherwise, I'll pass it over to, to Kevin to round things out. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's a good closure. Uh, thanks again, and I uh, hope everyone uh, enjoys the remainder of your day. And uh, uh, just, just I feel grateful to everybody for making this possible. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of conversation. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, CB. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, CB, because you. you're absolutely... Okay.